We're currently studying the faith cycle out of Hebrews 11, 1 through 40. And I've tried to follow the writer of Hebrews outline of Hebrews 11 of dividing uh, biblical history into four groups of believers who live the faith cycle throughout the, their, their period, their generation of biblical history. And, and we talked about how they passed the baton on to the next one. And Hebrews 11, 4 through 7 talks about the antediluvian period, the period before the flood. And then the patriarch period, uh, verses 8 through 22, and the Jewish period, uh, 23 through 38, and then the church age period, 39 and 40. And what I'm going to do each week, we, 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 we kind of look to show you that Hebrews 11, 1 is a mechanics passage rather than a definition of faith, a mechanics of faith. Faith is the assurance of things hoped for, the conviction of things not seen. And then he goes through a long list of different believers who have walked that faith walk uh, strong enough to pass the baton into a second generation or, or a, 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 new, uh, a new biblical period. And what I'm going to do now for the next couple of weeks, I'm going, to, I'm going to pick one person out of each period <clears throat> and talk about their walk of faith. And that at least caught the writer's attention. <clears throat> In the antediluvian period, he recorded three out of ten people there are 10 people recorded in the antediluvian period from Adam to Abraham. You can read that 10 generational group of people in uh, Genesis 5. They record them. And only three out of the 10 made his list. Uh, he talked about Abel who is not even in the list of Genesis 5, because it starts with Seth. But he talks about Abel and then Enoch and then Noah. Uh, the reason I chose Noah is that he's the last one mentioned in the group. He is the last... leader mentioned of the antediluvian period. He and his three sons and all of their wives traveled by the ark out of one civilization into another. They sailed the ark out of the antediluvian period and into the post-diluvian period in which we live. I thought that was kind of interesting, and so I've, I, now Enoch is really, it was hard to choose between him and Enoch because they both are recorded to have walked with God, and Enoch is kind of a flashy guy too, but I chose Noah because of, people know about Noah a little bit, I don't know they know a lot about him. They know mostly that he's got he he sail he floated a zoo, <laughs> but but here we are uh, in Hebrews eleven seven our text out of Hebrews eleven. He starts with what he's been doing all the way through. <clears throat> he's going to use this phrase eighteen times in Hebrews eleven. He says by faith. Each time it's instrumental, singular, feminine, and it's a clue. It's a, we look for markers when we study the Bible, and that certainly is one. And it's working off verse 1, and so here we are, by faith Noah, <clears throat> being, war <clears throat> excuse me, being warned by God <clears throat> about things not yet seen. I want to pause there for a moment. Hebrews 11, 1 says what? What's Hebrews 11, 1 say? 
Faith is the substance of things hoped for and the evidence of things or the conviction of things not seen. <clears throat> so we're dealing with that. Now here we is Noah being warned by God about things not yet seen. <clears throat> In reverence to what he had been warned about, in reverence about he had, what he had been, uh, the word reverence, uh, the concept is he took the word of God as given to him as a warning to his civilization. He took it very seriously. Yeah, I'm not sure everybody takes the word of God taught to them seriously. And so I think that's a great point. <clears throat> What's also interesting about verse 7 is the word warning. It's an aorist passive participle. And the word reverence, or however, how, however that's translated in your Bible, is an aorist passive participle. In other words, these two ideas are linked. Noah being warned about it, uh, warned by God about things not yet seen in reverence, prepared an ark for the salvation of his two household. In other words, the prophetic warning that God gave Noah was absolutely, completely, 100% the reason he built the ark. And and the reason he built the ark was due to the warning of the flood. Now, they had never, they had never seen a flood. I don't know. We're not sure they had ever seen it rain before it rained. Because the dew was dealing, but they sure never saw a flood. A, the Lord revealed to him something that he had never seen and would not see, would not see until the flood came. Uh, uh, and, the, and, and this will be a flood of all floods. This will flood the whole world, not just a region. In reverence, prepared an ark for the salvation of his household by which he condemned the world and became an heir of the righteousness, which is according to faith. I want to call your attention to, to, to three times the word faith. The emphasis is on the word faith. By faith, Noah was warned and Noah prepared. It is when it says <clears throat> by which, it's dia plus the ablative of a relative pronoun, hos. And it's talking about his faith. By faith, he was warned, and by faith, he prepared. And it was by this faith that he condemned the world <clears throat> and became an heir of righteousness, which is according to the faith. The whole subject here is about the faith. The whole subject. So I don't want you to miss that. Let's have a word of prayer, and we'll get into our study this evening about the faith of Noah. I give you a moment of silence as a believer priest and dwelt by the Holy Spirit. The reasonable responsibility to confess your sin because personal sin puts you in carnality and carnality takes you out of the ministry of the Holy Spirit. Evidence of carnality is personal sin. It could be mental attitude type sins, sins of the tongue or reverse sins. They must be confessed in silence and privacy. For the Holy Spirit to teach you the truth of the word of God, according to John 14, 26. So let's be sure we handle all that. Confess your sin and he's faithful and just to forgive you and cleanse you. Our Father, we're thankful tonight for these that have come our way by the automobile and the Internet. Especially on a stormy night in Birmingham, Alabama. We're not complaining about it, Father, because we've been in a dry spell. We're always thankful for what you give us. 
and it's always, always good. So tonight, Father, we talk about a, a rain that came for 40 days and 40 nights. And after a year, the whole world was flooded and a new civilization arose and a new period, the post-Diluvian. This man was honored, put in the scriptures as one of those heroes of the faith. May we do honor tonight by talking about God and the Lord Jesus Christ and this man who walked the walk, not just the talk, but we've made our prayer in Jesus' name. Amen. Well, the only reason that I personally chose Jonah is because he was the last believer of the antediluvian world. He sailed a boat out of one civilization and sailed it into another one that he did not know about. And that's a pretty amazing task. Also, remember that when you're studying Hebrew, Old Testament, biblical names are important. Biblical names, especially on key people, will reflect something prophetic about their role in the plan of God. That's true with Noah. He was a man who walked at some point in his life with a consistent attitude about faith. <clears throat> That's the Noah we know. He lived 950 years. We know a great deal about him after he turned 500. We met him in the middle of his life. In his life sojourn. That's where we meet Noah. The other 500 years, we don't know too much about him. We meet him in the 500th year of his life out of a 950 lifespan. But what we know out of that 500 years, that next 450 years of his life, we know a lot about. And I suppose there's a point for us. Prior to your salvation, you had a life. You probably yourself wouldn't care about going back to it. And this is another part of your life, not just when you got saved, but when you became a serious believer in the Word of God. Because in your carnal days, you behaved like an unbeliever anyhow. Even though you knew in your heart if you died, you'd go to heaven. You didn't have a consistency with God. You didn't have a walk. You had a he had somewhat of a talk, but you didn't have a walk. When that comes to your life, it's really a bigger deal than you really know. When God sits down and has that serious conversation with you about becoming a real deal, stop being the phony baloney. I want you, I've got a task for you. And sometimes our guilt from our past keep us from moving forward for a while. <clears throat> our guilt from our past. But at some point, you just have to take what God said seriously. I have forgiven you. Let's move on. Let's not keep bringing up old past. I don't. Why do you? Because when he forgives a sin, as far as this from the east as is the west and so on. But when you get serious with God about this importance of walking by faith, it's not about me, it's about Christ. It's not about my life, it's about what God wants from my life. Then you're going to meet a guy like Moses. You're going to meet a guy like Noah. You're going to meet a guy like Enoch. You're going to meet these people. They're going, to pass your, they're going to pass through your life. You're going to meet these people. These people are going to touch your life in ways that, that's going to be beneficial to you in the total part of your growth. You're going to meet all kinds 
of spiritual mature people who are walking the walk, are struggling with the walk, but they're there. They're engaged in it. And your life is going to be benefited for it. You got to pay attention when he crosses your path with other people. <clears throat> and he has in your life done that. You would not be here tonight if he hadn't already done that. But he wants to do it. That's a constant. You're going to be engaged with more people are going to cross your life that are serious about the word. They take it seriously. <laughs> and uh, so we're with, we're with a guy like that tonight. We're with a guy called Noah. Noah. Now, when his father named him, his father had a clue of that. Lamech. So Lamech, when he named him, it says, now he, referring to Lamech, called his name Noah, saying, and this is a prophetic idea, this one will give us rest from our work and from the toils of our hands arising from the ground which the Lord has cursed. Where did we get that idea? Got it out of the antediluvian period. That came out of Genesis 3, 17 through 19, and Adam's curse, right? <clears throat> he saw in his son Noah <clears throat> this prophetic idea, and he called him Noah because it means rest. It means comfort or consolation. You always want to remember that about Noah. That, that's recorded in the genealogy of Genesis 5.29. Enoch and Noah are the only two believers out of this antediluvian period who were given special recognition in their genealogy, which is kind of important. We're not going to look at it tonight, but I would encourage you to see that. And that's why this writer picked them. <laughs> This writer was a student of the genealogy of Christ. And he picked these two guys. He picked Abel, who had the same reputation. And he picked Enoch and he picked Noah because of what had been written by God about their life of a walk of faith. Well worth your read. <clears throat> they both were men who walked with God but they're given special recognition in their genealogy and he picked them out of that genealogy. That's how they got. And that's why there's only three. Now my lesson tonight are four aspects of the faith of Noah. This man, when you walk by faith and the faith cycle becomes important, the inhale exhale of the word of God becomes a daily exercise of great importance to you the daily exercise. So here's point number one. God chose Noah, God chose Noah to be the spiritual bridge from the antediluvian world to the post-diluvian period. Don't you know that that was a top pick? Don't you know there was a lot of importance placed on him in the divine scheme when the prophetic word was given to his father to call him Noah. That this man is going to represent the, the rest, the peace, the rest peace of God upon a civilization. They better pay attention to this guy. They better pay attention to this guy. If they want to know the grace rest in God, this man's going to teach it. He's going to teach the grace rest of God to his people. And he did. He was called a preacher of righteousness. He did it. And his story is one to be reminded of. Because after a hundred years of preaching and walking, the truth out among his people. He had seven converts. A hundred. 
100 years. Yeah. That's a lot of, that's a lot of preaching. And those eight who got in that boat now knew the importance of having Noah as their lead guy because they're going to find rest while everybody else is going to find the raft of God. So God chose Noah to be the spiritual bridge from the antediluvian world to the post-diluvian world. How important is that to you and I? We both live in the post-diluvian world. <laughs> the world in which we live in is called post-diluvian in biblical civilizational history. And we live in the post-diluvian period until the second coming of Christ. That's why it's important to you and I. It's also why Jesus compared the days of Noah to the days of the Son of Man. In Luke, the 17th chapter, 22 through 27, Jesus made a very strong comparison. As it was in the days of Noah, so shall it be in the days of the Son of Man. Not only did they, not only do they discuss, did Jesus discuss the days. Now listen to me, it's very important. Not only discuss the days of Noah, but he discussed the day of Noah. Not only did he discuss the days of the Son of Man, but he discussed the day of the Son of Man. The days of the Son of Noah, the days of, the, of uh, the days of Noah were the days when people were getting, given a privilege by the preaching of God's grace to get in, to get, you're going to need a pass to ride this boat, this ark. Out of this, out of the judgment of God. And everyone who believes the gospel of Jesus Christ gets a board pass. And those who don't, don't. Think about that. Think about that. So Jesus brings that up. The day of Noah is the day of judgment. The day of the Son of Man is the day of judgment. The days are when you get an opportunity to sign up and get in. Judgment day is coming. We all preach it. Judgment day is coming. That was, Noah preached the same stuff we preach. Judgment day is coming. You need to get aboard. Jesus discussed it in Luke 17, well worth your read, 17, 22 through 27. Noah was chosen because he reached spiritual maturity, like in Ephesians 4, 11, the mature man in Christ. <laughs> Noah was chosen because he reached spiritual maturity at the age of 500, and he maintained super grace status until the flood. <laughs> super grace status is discussed, and I have shown it to you in 2 Thessalonians 1, 4, it's used by the word Hooper Oxano, translated in your Bible as faith greatly enlarged. The second point I want to make to you about Noah is that in biblical history, the antediluvian period, that is from the fall of Adam, the fall off of Adam, the fall of Adam, <clears throat> until the worldwide flood in the days of Noah, or in what we would specifically called the day of Noah, the flood. We are reminded there are three biblical civilizations of the human race, according to the Bible, biblical history. They are discussed in 2 Peter, 3rd chapter, verses 5 and 6. The antediluvian period is mentioned as the ancient world or long ago. The post-diluvian is mentioned in 2 Peter 3, 7, by the present world. And the millennium is not mentioned. It goes to the new. So I put the millennium in you for you. That's the third civilization of the human race. Revelation, the 20th chapter, verse 1 and 6. 
I'm often asked by people, where do you get the idea of a millennial reign? Millennial means a thousand years in the Greek, a thousand years. Well, you can get out of Old Testament prophecy, Ezekiel and Daniel and places like that. But you can get it in Revelation 20, because in Revelation, the 20th chapter, verse 1 through 6, where they discuss the millennial reign of a thousand years, the word thousand is used, it's used six times. Well, it's used in every verse but one. It's used five times. It may have been used six, because it may have been used double, but I don't remember. But it's used in every verse. In Revelation, the 20th chapter, verses 1 through 6, where it's discussed, it's not called millennium, it's called thousand years. But it, the thousand years is mentioned in every verse but the first verse that introduced it. That's a pretty strong marker. So the word millennium is a thousand years. Peter referred, he, he, and in that passage of 2 Peter, he talks about the period, the world long ago, the world present, and the new world. Peter referred to the new world as the heavens and the earth. When he, he talks this way about it, he talks about the heaven and the earth long ago, present, and new. He does this in verse 13 of 2 Peter, the third chapter, verse 13. Now, the whole discussion for you to read is 2 Peter 3, 10 through 19, well worth your read which is discussed in Revelation, the 20th chapter, verse 11, through the 22nd chapter, or the end of the Revelation book. The post-Diluvian period, the period in which you and I live in to the second coming of Christ, is unique because it contains both the first coming of Christ, called the days of the Son of Man, and the second coming of Christ, referred to as the day of the Son of Man, in Luke 17 verses 30 to 31. I picked Noah for that reason to bring that out. Remember that there are the days of Noah and there's the day of Noah. There are the, and it, it's the days prior to the flood and then the flood comes. There are the sons, the days of the son of man. Now in the midst of this second Peter three, Verse 9, that whole chapter is devoted to the second coming of Christ and the end of time and all that. Verse 9 is important in 2 Peter 3, 9. Because it says that God is long-suffering and patient that none would perish, but all would come to repentance, change their mind about Christ and be saved. <clears throat> it was true in the antediluvian period. It's true in the post-diluvian period. It'll be true in the millennial age. God is long-suffering. He is patient that none would perish. <clears throat> but if they choose not to believe that Christ came into the world to die for their sins, to be buried and raised from the dead, the message I have to the post diluvian people, you will die in a perishing state. You will stand before the great white throne judgment of Revelation 20, and you will be sentenced to the lake of fire forever and ever. You say, well, that's a pretty harsh treatment. I know, but you have, to, you have to take in view what God did so that you could come into the kingdom by grace. He sent his son to die a horrendous death for the sins of the humanity, all of the sins of Adam and personal sin. It's called the crucifixion or the cross. When God shut the lights out of heaven for three hours and poured upon him the sins of the human race from beginning to end. And the father listens to the son cry out, my God, my God, why have you forsaken me? Now the son knows why he's forsaken him because he's dying for the sins of humanity. If you wonder why the Father has made a very narrow ideal with you, the narrow deal is this. The only way to God and the only way to heaven is through Jesus Christ. He died on the cross for your sins. He was buried and raised from the dead to give you that passage. The boat is going to sail. 
the day of judgment is going to come. It's called the day of the Son of Man. You can either get on board or you can take the suffering consequences. Now, the thing about it, it doesn't require anything from you to get on board. Nobody paid for the ark but God. Nobody paid for Noah to preach but God. Nobody's asking you for anything but to believe. Well, my dear heart, those who are listening for me from the Internet, that's got to be done. The gospel is the power of God into salvation to everyone who believes. When you believe, Ephesians 2, 8, 9 says you're saved by grace. God does all the work you do, all the receiving. You're saved by grace through faith, believing by faith. Not of yourself, is a gift. You can roll the dice, but I can tell you those dice have already been rolled once. And only eight guys, only eight people came out of the antediluvian period of thousands of millions. The rest are on. The post-diluvian period will come. There will be a day of judgment and they will go down by fire. Second Peter third chapter says the post diluvian world will come to an end by fire. Yeah. Read it in Second Peter three. The third point. The flood in the day of Noah purged the antediluvian world of unbelievers. Not one unbeliever escaped the judgment of the flood. Not one. Not one. All eight people on board the ark are believers in the gospel of Christ. It will not be any different in your day. It never has been. I don't care how arrogant you think this is. I heard a president's and ex-president sons, sons say that he could take everything. If there's such as a, a, a hell, he is ready to take everything he got to send him. He has no idea. He has no idea. I beg you not to go that route. That is not the route to go. That is not the route to go. And it doesn't have to be. You don't have to be arrogant like that. The flood purged the anti-living world of unbelievers. 1 Peter 3.20 says, And did not spare the ancient world. Preserved Noah, a preacher of righteousness, with seven others, his sons and their wife, along with his wife, when he brought a flood, he capped the letters H. When he brought a flood upon the world of the ungodly. The world of the ungodly. Guys like this to shake their fist at God and think they're equal to him in life and death. The th truth is you're, you're not equal in either of them. <laughs> but listen, my job is not to convince you. My job is to tell you the truth. The job of the Holy Spirit is to convince you. His job is to convict you of sin, of righteousness, and judgment. All of three are important out of John 16. But I can tell you the truth. And if you believe it, the truth is such free. Eight souls traveled out of the antediluvian world into the post-diluvian world in a floating zoo called the Ark. It could have been a party of a whole lot of people. That was a huge boat. And listen, God told him how big to build it because God knew in his heart how many people were going to get on it. 
he still built a big boat. And God knew there's only going to be eight people. And he still built a big boat, built a big boat. You know why? As a sign of judgment. A sign of judgment. Well, that's a big boat. Who's going to be on it? Well, I have eight passengers right now, <clears throat> but there's plenty of room for everybody. And I'm confident that if we fill this boat, we'll get another hundred years to build another one. <clears throat> right? Why? Because God is long-suffering and patient. He built a huge boat for people, filled it with animals, because people wouldn't come. Should have been a floating church. Became a floating zoo because of volition. Hmm. Point number four. At the age of 500, about half his lifespan, living to be 950, Noah reached spiritual maturity, a status we call super grace, through a consistent inhale and exhale of the faith cycle. 2 Thessalonians 1.3 talks about that. At the age of 500, he began preaching and warning of the coming judgment upon his world. Noah began preaching the gospel of the righteousness of God in Christ. Taken from Genesis 3.15 as his proof text. Later discussed out of the life of Abraham in Galatians 3.8. You mean Noah preached the gospel? Absolutely he preached it. It was a prophetic gospel. One day Christ would come and die on a cross, be buried and raised from the dead. You ought to read Galatians 3.8 if you wonder how the Jew got saved and how did the people in the antediluvian world get saved. 2 Peter 2.5 is one of those marvelous verses. In 2 Corinthians 5.21, he who knew no sin became sin for us that we might be made the righteousness of God in Christ. You're not righteous in God because of your works. You're made righteous because of the work of Christ. You're saved by grace through faith and not of yourself as a gift. They didn't get in the boat then. People don't get in the boat now. But listen, it's crazy. It's crazy not to do that. In Hebrews 11, 7, the word faith, because he believes he has faith. When you believe the word of God, you have faith in the word of God. So the word faith is used by faith, Noah, by which faith he condemned the world. According to his faith, faith is mentioned three times. Now, what's interesting, I want you to go to me, with me to Genesis 7 for a moment. Let's just show, I want to show you something. Genesis 7, 6. I should go, I should give you, let's go Genesis, I'm going to go there, but let's go Genesis 5, 32. Where Noah is identified with us as 500 years old, and he's the father of three sons. Are you with me? Yes. Let's go to verse 7. I mean, let's go to chapter 7 now. And notice in verse 1, the Lord tells Noah to enter the ark. Are you with me? Yes. In verse 6, watch this now, in verse 6. Now Noah was, six, was 600 years old when the flood of water came upon the earth. You got me? <clears throat> and then he's going, to, he's going to begin to do a countdown in verse 11. In the 600th year of Noah's life, in the seventh month, on the 17th day of the month, on the same day, all the fountains of the great deep burst open, and the floodgates of heaven were opened, <clears throat> and this is the water that they are going to be contending with for 40 days and 40 nights. It's coming out of heaven and is coming up out of earth for 40 days and 40 nights. Okay? 
I'm trying to give you a timeline on the life of Noah. I'm trying to give you a timeline. A timeline on the life of Noah. He and his family, at the age of 600, he and his family, his boys are married and got wives, right? right. His, he and his family enter the ark, and the rain poured for 40 days and 40 nights, like in verse 12, like the read, one we read, and flooded the earth for 150 days. That's in verse 24, okay? A year later, from the time they entered the ark, about a year later, they left the ark in Genesis 8, 13 through 17, and entered another civilization. The only, belie the only people that came out of the antediluvian world into the post-diluvian world were believers. Now listen to me. The only ones that are going to leave the post-diluvian period for the next period of civilization, you know who are going to be? Believers. Yeah, and you know what that event's going to be called? The rapture. The rapture for us is the ark for them. Those who have died are coming. Those of us who are alive are going to be caught up. You understand? We go through a seven years of tribulation to complete the Jewish age, and now we're into the millennial age. It's just kind of interesting. Both civilizations are going to have the same experience. Out of the millennial age will come believers, and out of all of these periods will come all of the believers for the new heaven and the new earth, which is Revelation 21, 22. I guess we'll start all over again. I don't know. I only have two chapters on it, so I don't have a lot of information. <laughs> and that's a good thing. <laughs> You see, this is what Jesus is talking about in Luke 17, 26, 27, or that 22 through 27 passage. This is what he's talking about. He's talking to the post-Diluvian people. And listen, now here's what we know. And, this, and he's really up, he's really pressing on it. You know what I mean? Really pressing. Why? Listen to me now, this is important. Because when he comes into the post-Diluvian period, the post-Diluvian period is in the last days. When he dies on the cross, is buried and raised from the dead, and is seated at the right hand of God, we're in the last hour of the last days of the post-Diluvian civilization. <clears throat> we're there, people. I don't know if you know it or not. We are there. And do you know what's going to increase? You know, if you study the antediluvian period, and you should, because it's a preview, the absolute corruptness of ungodliness and depravity of man was rampant on the earth. In the last days of the last day, the last hour was corrupt in every sense of the word. Yeah. But, but look, the message still has to be preached, doesn't it? Yes. Noah preached it the last day he was still preaching the gospel of God's righteousness in Christ, and judgment is coming. And don't you know the last day the plea was more difficult, the friends and family members that don't believe? What a terrible day that is. Chuck Farmer used to talk about them, people pounding on the side of the ark after it rained uh, 10 days and 10 nights. And we're still able to float.
I had a professor in my theology school who thought all this was a myth. All of it was a myth. I said to him, how is it that you could be a Christian professor in a Christian school teaching me theology, Christian theology, and believe that the death of Christ on the cross, the three-day burial and resurrection is a myth? Oh, he said, I don't believe that. I said, yes, you do, sir. Because if it was Jesus that said, as, as Jonah was three days and three nights in the be belly of a whale, which he believed was a myth as well, if that's a myth, if Jonah's a myth, and boy, they really believe Noah, Noah was, they really believe Jonah was. I said, if they're myths, then why are you preaching Christ in a Christian school if the death, burial, and resurrection of Christ is a myth? Reply. Yeah. Mm -hmm. What was his reply? Well, he, he, he said, I see it differently. I, I see it as a myth. And I went, how can you believe a myth? How can you believe a myth? He said, well, I believe Jesus is real, but I think all this other stuff was just like prophecy or something. I don't think it was real. I think at the time, and I went, and they, need, and they would always do the same thing. They would go to historical writings out of anthropology and back their story. Well, other people, there are other civilizations had a story of, of uh, a flood Oh, well, yeah. Where do you think they got it? But my pastor gave me great advice. My pastor said to me, why are you going? Because I was always upset. Because <laughs> my, my faith was being enormously challenged. And he said, well, why are you going to school? I mean, why, why are you going? I said, well, I really have to have a degree to be within the system if I don't have a degree from a, a respected university, uh, I'm not going to be able to get in the denomination. I'm not going to be able to get in it, and I'm not going to be able to stay in it without approval. I need a certificate. I need a, I need a, you know, I need a degree from the, from some university uh, that's recognized by by my denomination. He said, <laughs> he didn't said, shut up, get your degree, and don't believe anything they say. And so I did. Yeah. I fed them back their information. Didn't believe it, but I fed it back to them. I fed back what they wanted to hear because they wouldn't let me talk after a while. I fed them back the information, got my degree, and then discovered I didn't need it. But I'm glad I had it. But I, I realized that none of the guys that I follow had a degree, not even Jesus. You know, but I learned that after I got mine the hard way. But anyhow, I still recommend that. I don't think that's a bad idea. I don't think education's a bad idea. Uh, I think God promotes you, though. I don't think denominations do, but that's, that's just my personal opinion. Noah and his family were the first foreign missionaries to the post-Diluvian period. What do you think of that, Rick? First foreign missionaries to the post-Diluvian period. Just think about that. When you go off on a, on a mission trip, and think about what you got to preach. Think about what you got to preach. The old boy preached it too. Noah lived 350 years after the flood as a missionary to the post-Luvian world. 350 years after the flood, this guy is a missionary to the post-Luvian world. Must have did a pretty good job. We're here. Genesis 9, 28 and 29 will give you that information. Noah and Shem, his son that came on the boat, were linked to the Messianic genealogy of Luke, the third chapter, verse 36. <laughs> Now, what's my point to you tonight? This is why I'm so thankful you weathered the storm and came out. Even my sweet wife. Of course, we don't have electricity at the home, and that was a... 
Uh, that was kind of a little push from the father. But you don't normally have to push her. Well, normally you have to push her, but you don't have to push her to get here. Well, you do have to push her. Well, I don't know. Just hush. Yeah. <laughs> need to get out of that one, don't I, Sam? I need to get out of that. I need to back, with, back that car out of that mud hole. Uh, I see, I'm enormously encouraged by Noah because of that reason. I'm an ambassador for Christ. May I wear my gospel shoes all the time. I, I seize upon every opportunity. I know as you do. I can only speak for myself because I can't walk in your moccasins. That's an inside joke, by the way. Uh, anyhow, uh, we're all ambassadors, and uh, we salute the first one, who was Noah. And maybe we can have 350 years. What do you think? No, I don't think so. <laughs> Let me think how many birthday cakes that guy ate before he died. Uh? <laughs> I know by now he's saying, I'll take banana pudding. Skip the cake. I, I'll just take banana pudding. God gave Noah and the post-living world a wonderful sign of the rainbow, didn't they? You know, every time you see the rainbow, I want you to think about your responsibility to share the gospel with people because we're in the last days of, we're in the last hour of the last days. And listen, your job's not to convince them but your job is to tell them the truth and love them. Tell them the truth and love them. And you keep telling the truth till both one of you die. You keep telling the truth. Listen, it's done better in love than anything, in my opinion. I've done it all the different ways it can be done. I've stomped my foot and I've hollered. And I found the best thing is to keep the door open as long as you can. And then at the funeral, preach to the people the love of God in Christ. And leave the rest up to God to deal with what, however he has to deal with it. God gave Noah in the post of living the great sign of the rainbow. And it has a lot of meaning, but it should, I mean, it's not just a rainbow with a bunch of colors. You need to know the true meaning of the rainbow, and when you see it, it ought to motivate you to share the gospel with somebody because it's a sign from God about the man Noah who was the first foreign missionary who served honorably for 350 years as far as we know. Not without problems. Come on now. Not without problems. You're not going to get through life without some problems because you live in the devil's world. You have flesh. But there's a better day coming. The day of judgment for others is the day of glory for you and I. The day of judgment for others is the day of glory for you and I. So we are ambassadors. God, we thank you for Noah. And Yeah. You know, there's a there's a, a, a replica of the ark mm -hmm. up in northern Kentucky. Yeah. It is a mind-boggling sight. Yeah. Yeah. Do you remember what city that's in? I forget what that is. Right. It's just right before you go into Ohio. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah. I've heard people. People have 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 talked to me about that. Yeah. And yeah. Oh, is it, it pretty good, huh? Not that good. They have dinosaurs. Dinosaurs. They have dinosaurs. Oh, I got you. Their theology. They're I got you. But the, the, it's beautiful. Yeah. I mean, without, I mean, the outside of it, the inside of it. Yeah. The size of it's overwhelming, huh? Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. The size of it. Well, I wondered yeah. about that. They had better tools. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. <laughs> They probably didn't take him that, that length of time to build that baby. All right, well, look, let's have a word of prayer. Uh, we'll dismiss our group that's on the Internet with us, and then we'll have a short time of period, a period of prayer for our group.
Father, we're thankful today for these that have come by automobile and the internet and those who have stayed with us on the internet. I know we've given you a lot of information. You need to download our our, pass, our sheet. We have it if you'll go to our website, Doctrinal Studies, on the internet. You can download uh, the page and the paper and all the information, like I said, uh, when I tell my people, this is well worth your read, they have it on their paper to read. Uh, so you can do that uh, at no cost. And so, Father, we thank you for this time together. And uh, it's raining outside. <laughs> and I'm not fearful at all of it. If there was fire outside, I might be a little fearful. But I have a rainbow to remind us it'll never be by water again. The whole world will not be, but it will, it will be by fire. So when we see a rainbow, our heart gets excited. And even little children love rainbows. That's interesting to me. Their little heart gets excited about a rainbow. And uh, one of the things they love to do is in primary colors is to color a rainbow. And they put all the colors in. I know mine all did. We could tell that we would tell them the story and and what a wonderful what a wonderful God we serve. What a wonderful father he is to us. We thank you for that, Father, in Jesus' name. Amen.